Good morning, everyone. Uh, our roll call is basically complete because we've heard from all commissioners other than Rita Semmel, and we've heard from her that she'll be on shortly. Uh, can I have a um, motion item two for the adoption of our agenda? Hello? George moved it. Okay, George. Second. Okay. Oh, okay. I'm I'm unmuted. Um, I'll move adoption. Okay. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. Oh. And um, item three: Can I have an adoption of our November 18th regular meeting minutes? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 So moved. Holding. Question. Uh, item four on the agenda is our executive director's report. Trent. Thank you, President Kahn. Good morning, President Kahn, commissioners. Um, I see we have a lot of people on. Um, I presume that they're here to celebrate Ms. Isom and not to hear my executive director's report, but they're going to have to suffer through it anyway before we get to celebrate Sophia. Um, I think it's a testament to how uh, how fond so many people are of, of Sophia, both personally and professionally, that so many people are on, but we'll get to that in a bit. I'll try to be quick. Um, I'll start uh, at the federal level, not, not there's a lot going on, but, but not a lot of progress, or maybe some progress, towards the Build Better Back um, legislation that, that we're trying to get through, which I talked about last month, um, if it does go through, will benefit so many of our households, families, children, seniors, through a whole uh, myriad of uh, programs. Um, I won't roll through those again, um, just say that, that we're hoping that that gets passed before the holidays. Uh, and if it does, I will certainly walk everyone through next month. Um, so at the state level, really good news, um, coming out on the budget front. Uh, the budget won't be, uh, won't be proposed by the governor until January, but, but the Legislative Analyst Office projects a $31 billion surplus for the budget year <clears throat> that begins July 1st, 2022. Um, a whole slew of, of different state revenue streams out outperformed the initial projections. And so, the, you know, which is lending to the surplus. A lot of the surplus, however, is projected to be one time so about three to eight billion uh, would be ongoing, which you know limits sort of how much state investment could go towards uh, uh, you know ongoing programs. Um, fix my camera a little bit. There we go. Uh, so for example, last year the state expanded the housing programs on a one-time basis, expressed an intent to do that again this this year, and it seems like as fiscally viable. And so within the context of that budget surplus, the County Welfare Directors Association. Uh, we met in our annual legislative retreat a couple of weeks ago. And I think I said, uh, I informed you commissioners that I will serve as the association's president for 2022. So we'll be very active um, this coming year in, in shepherding a lot of these priorities through, but I wanna walk through a few of them um, so you can understand what we're working on at the state level, uh, starting now, really, but really heating up more in January and February. So the first one is um, around emergency services and dis disaster response. As you know, the Human Services Agency, not only ours, but all of them across the state, uh, have a, a vital role in responding to disasters of all sorts, whether it's the pandemic, uh, earthquake, uh, fires in some of the rural counties, um, uh, we as human service agencies are required to be at, at, at the, the forefront. We, we provide the, the care, the shelter, food support. Uh, we do that through uh, disaster service workers, which are basically human services employees who step up to do these, this work. But at the same time, we have to maintain our continuity of operations. And, and especially in the pandemic, when we saw an increased need on our services on the benefit side, um, same thing with a fire or an earthquake. And so we have sort of these dual, sometimes competing roles um, and our, stretch, our staff are stretched very thin. And we don't get any state reimbursement or support to do this. We do get federal money through FEMA, 
um, to reimburse uh, many of our costs, that's generally retroactive reimbursement. And so what we're proposing to do is to get the state to finally recognize the, the role that counties play and, and to uh, provide every county human service agency with, with five uh, funding for five positions to do emergency response planning, to coordinate and support response efforts, to support recovery, uh, and to maintain continuity of services, and then and also to support other counties in mutual aid. A good example of mutual aid would be during the fire season where you know, obviously San Francisco generally is not gonna have to worry about uh, uh, big fires, but our neighbors to the North and the Central Valley do, and, and we would you know, uh, provide mutual aid in terms of helping them maintain their continuity of operations. Similarly, if we have a big earthquake, we would rely on, on counties who aren't affected to come assist us. And so funding for that sort of mutual aid support. The proposal that we're, that we're pushing would also uh, establish an ongoing state funded California Emergency Assistance Fund, which would be dollars directly from the state to our families who are impacted, families and single adults and seniors. It would also suspend um, certain outcome and quality improvement uh, activities that the state requires us to do. Um, things like uh, quality assurance improvement plans and in-home supportive services and child welfare, sort of this monitoring um, activities that, that the state does that requires a lot of our staff work would be suspended. And so it's really the first time that we've pushed an, uh, uh, a proposal like this. And given the surplus, we're hoping that, that well, given the surplus and given the context uh, within which we're, we're pushing this, which is of course the ongoing pandemic, we're hoping that it gets some traction. <clears throat> Uh, another uh, top priority for us is transitional housing for foster youth who are under age 18. We have a, a transitional housing placement program, we call it THPP, for minors who are 16 and 17 years old. It's a state licensed um, foster care housing placement. Um, we use it often as a step down from STRTPs, sort of step down in, in level of care for some youth who have higher support needs. It's a small program, but it's very impactful. We used to get federal money for it, but under the uh, federal um, FFPSA or the Family First Prevention Services Act that passed a couple years ago, it's now no longer federally reimbursable. So what we're proposing is to establish a new licensing category that had, with associated state funding to support this housing, sort of step down housing for our, our uh, foster youth, our older youth who are still in care. Um, this would increase access to services and supports for these youth and, and really um, would help sort of smaller community-based homes who are unable to convert to the STRTP um, uh, licensing category. So a lot of them uh, um, are no longer available to, to, to provide placement. So it wouldn't restore the sort of the older, the sort of the group home model, but would allow some of these more grassroots community-based homes to apply under this licensing category to provide care for, uh, for the um, A third priority, getting some feedback, that's better, um, is around um, improving the system of care for real high need youth in our systems. Um, youth who need intensive mental health support, sometimes 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, youth who struggle in, in placements, who we and other counties have a hard time finding placements that, that are suitable and match their needs. And so the proposal will be to establish a, a state children's crisis program for foster youth with these needs, who, who really sometimes in counties are placed in county offices or in hotel rooms um, or in Airbnbs. Um, it would provide Funding it would provide a licensing category and would hopefully expand the number of beds available um, in a really intensive therapeutic environment, uh, and it would be limited to six or fewer kids at a time. It wouldn't be a, it's not a group home. It's really it's not an STRTP. It's really a shorter term emergency placement to allow our our protective service workers to place kids quickly, quickly. who have these high needs. And then the last uh, area again. Uh, around child welfare, but also touches our adult protective services program. And that's expanding the capacity in our schools of social work to uh, increase the number of students who get masters in social work. Um, we hire MSWs or, or, or graduates from, from social work programs in child welfare. We also hire them in APS, 
Adult Protective Services. We get Title IV refunding, federal money to support some of that work. But there are just simply too few social workers coming through the pipe pipeline who want to work in government or who want to work in child welfare, adult protective services. So what this proposal will do will require the Secretary of Health and Human Services to convene a working group with representatives of the chancellors of the UC and Cal State University systems really to, to convene a task force to develop short and longer term recommendations to expand MSW capacity at all of our um, campuses throughout the state. It's a $60 million proposal. Um, $50 million would provide grants to schools to begin to build the program, would uh, potentially expand um, monies uh, for students who want to work in government or in public social services, really try to just improve that pipeline so we can get more MSWs, we can get more diverse graduates of our schools of social work, and hopefully increase the number of MSWs who want to work in government. Um, so those are our state priorities, and I'll continue to update you all throughout the year on, on the progress once we secure authors and, and hopefully uh, uh, build coalitions for supporting those various initiatives. So switching gears to locally, uh, yesterday you may have seen, it might have been in the newspaper today or, or some media coverage yesterday, the mayor uh, gave uh, department heads budget instructions for the next two fiscal years. Remember, we're on a two-year budget cycle now. And so I'm really happy to share that for the first time since 1998, um, the San Francisco's actually projecting a surplus, a budget surplus for the next two years. It's not big, it's $108 million, which represents less than 1% of the city budget. Um, nevertheless, uh, it's it, our budget instructions for, again, the first time in 13 years are not going to require any cuts. So we are gonna be able to propose a budget um, without any reductions, including, I think, an opportunity to increase funding in some areas. Um, the, the instructions were, were not to submit budget proposals that increase costs or increase funding, but, but we have so many cost centers and revenue streams, there might be opportunities to sort of reprioritize and increase fundings in certain areas if, if we don't need as much funding in other areas. Um, the mayor did give us priorities. She really wants us, uh, these are her, her words, to really restore the vibrancy of the city, including public safety and street conditions. I think you've seen her recent announcements about addressing some of the street problems we're, we're seeing. I'm fine. Um, I was just calling to let you know Arlene had gotten a call from your mentor. Can, can someone mute? About oh, okay, thank you. Sorry. The challenges of Zoom meetings. Um, so restoring vibrancy of the city, focusing on economic recovery still, of course, and then delivering on accountability and equity in city spending. And so we'll be looking at our, our investments uh, as we have been doing for the number of years through an equity lens to see if we're reaching populations that, that uh, might've historically been underserved. And so through our whole array of, of dozens of programs. And, uh, and as we do every year, we'll be submitting um, developing our budget between now and, and later in January, and we'll be presenting this to you uh, in late January and February. The other local news um, that also got a little bit of attention um, was the mayor's introduction to the Board of Supervisors of the Children's First Ballot Initiative. And a lot of the news, which is really, it covers two things that I'll touch on. Much of the news was focused on the, the school board and how this, this ballot initiative will affect the relations between the school board and the mayor and the city government. It's really tying some requirements for city funding to uh, the school board meeting, the school board and the school district meeting certain goals around strategy and fiscal oversight and community engagement and the like. But the, the other piece that didn't get a lot of attention really does impact, has the potential to impact our work. Uh, and that is uh, the creation of a, a San Francisco Children's Agency. And the idea around this is to consolidate some city services to uh, better serve families and children and, and to put that under a single umbrella. So what the, the proposed ballot initiative will do, and again, this process wise, the mayor introduces the ballot initiative to the board. If the board votes, only needs six votes, so six out of 11 votes to get it, to put it on the ballot. And then the ballot, it would be a simple majority to pass. So the Children's First Reform at this Children's Agency and a Children's Agency Commission um, to streamline, and this is the language in the initiative, to quote, streamline how the city delivers funding and services from birth to transitional age youth. 
Um, but mechanically what it will do, it will um, form a children's agency that would consist of two existing city departments, um, the Department of Children, Youth and Families and the Office of Early Childhood, which formerly was the Office of Early Care and Education, which as you may recall in our budget, that office, which, which currently is under the Human Services Agency, uh, beginning July 1st of 22, that office is slated to become and budgeted to become an independent department called the Office of Early Childhood, which would also include the city's first five departments. So should this ballot initiative, should this initiative get on the ballot and pass, it would form this early child age, you know, this, um, children's agency, so DCYF, OECE, and first five. It does not, it does not propose to move any of the programs that HSA currently operates or any uh, children's rec programs or youth homelessness programs into the new agency. It's really about more sort of the contracted services rather than the direct services that are provided by city government. So the, the hundreds of contracts under the Department of Children, Youth and Families, the contracts under um, uh, Office of Early Childhood for child care subsidies, and, and those would be the two that would merge. It would require, however, from us to, to engage in a, a citywide planning process around children and youth ensure that our services are aligned with needs assessments that are done and really attempt to, to help us better uh, uh, coordinate, which will impact the services we provide under family and children's services and child welfare, foster care, services we provide to uh, low-income families through CalWORKs. Um, it wouldn't become operational until July of 2024, should it pass, so we will have a lot of time for planning should it, should it actually pass, should it get on the ballot pass. Briefly in COVID, um, uh, even you know, the, the pandemic is continuing, the numbers uh, are increasing slightly due to the Omicron variant, but there really is no change in our operations in terms of telecommuting, in terms of delivering services. The HSA workforce is 96% vaccinated or partially vaccinated. Um, we're moving to, to get into 100% compliance. Uh, and then Cal OSHA is requiring a COVID-19 prevention plan that we have completed, and that's posted on our intranet. Within our hotel system, the FEMA funding for our hotels has been extended through the end of March of next year. It'll add $26 million to our COVID sheltering effort in terms of federal dollars. Uh, as you know, that the operations of the hotels have shifted from HSA over to the Department of Homelessness and Supportive Housing. What they're going to do with that money is to take two of the SIP hotels that were slated to be demobilized uh, and rather than leave them vacant, they're actually converting them to winter shelters for uh, a couple hundred uh, beds or a couple hundred units of, of shelter through the winter that will be funded through FEMA. Moving on to our divisions, just a couple of updates and then we'll get to the celebration. Um, in our County Adult Assistance Program, um, we have really been and getting out in the community a lot more with, with CAP and getting uh, single adults uh, who are uh, low income onto, onto our benefits. We are outreaching at two of the safe sleep sites, uh, the Fulton site and the Jones site for the next month. Um, based on the initial data of who's at the sites, we think we'll enroll about 50 clients in CAP benefits from those sites. Again, these are sites that were set up under COVID. Uh, the coordinators are assisting to make sure the clients are attending the interviews for CAP, following up for any pap paperwork so we can minimize the number of, of individuals who are denied. So after we complete the outreach and the enrollment at these sites, we're going to move on to the three other safe sleep sites to get individuals who are there temporarily enrolled into benefits. You know, CAP opens doors to not just cash assistance, but potentially to SSI advocacy if they're disabled. Um, also, of course, for uh, opens, opens uh, avenues for eligibility for Medi-Cal, which is critical, and also CalFresh. Um, and if they're homeless, they can use those CalFresh benefits in restaurants. We also continue to do targeted outreach at our shelter in place hotels. Uh, we're training our SF Benefits Net outreach workers on the CAP process so we can do sort of an ex parte review for CAP eligibility along with CalFresh and Medi Cal again to get the, that wraparound set of benefits to our single adults who are homeless and living in our alternative housing system that we propped up under COVID. In Medi Cal, um, one shift that I just want to bring to your attention because I think it's a positive change for our, our beneficiaries, which is uh, the transition, the, the State Department of Healthcare Services transitioning Medi-Cal pharmacy services from managed care to the new Medi-Cal uh, fee-for-service pharmacy system, and it'll be effective in January. 
what it's gonna do is it's gonna standardize the pharmacy benefits statewide rather than the different benefits across different managed care plans across the state. Um, and it will improve access, which is the good thing, improve access to pharmacy services with a pharmacy network that includes a pop, about 94% of the state's pharmacies will be able to take Medi-Cal. And so our beneficiaries will be able to access Walgreens, um, CVS, whatever pharmacy might be more convenient for them and, and will help reduce um, uh, their, or standardize their uh, co-pays and their benefits. And then on the um, Medi-Cal waivers, we, as the public health emergency continues, the Medi-Cal re waivers remain. And these again are remain, they're waivers that are in place to ensure that beneficiaries maintain eligibility to Medi-Cal and access to health services. Um, so we're delaying any negative action or discontinuance. Um, and there's no official date for the expiration. We think at least through the end of March, similar to FEMA. Just to remind you, we have about 124,000 San Franciscans, um, San Francisco households who are actively on Medi-Cal and are protected by these waivers. So it's a really significant number of households who continue to get Medi-Cal health benefits during the pandemic. And then lastly, the family and children's services. Um, this is a bit related to our manager of the year. We did, as this, this program is under Sophia, uh, our resource family approval annual review, review was completed and the preliminary results went, uh, of the review was, was very well received. No major deficiencies or problems identified. The representatives from the State Department of Social Services that conducted the review were very impressed with the quality of our work and our practice and procedures um, that we've implemented. Again, the RFA was a transition that we did due to the uh, continuum of care reform, uh, AB 403, I believe, of a number of years ago. Our average Excuse me. Our average time to approval is 91 days. The state requirement is 90 days. The state average is well over 120 days. So we're, you know, we're really doing right by our families and our kids by getting those um, certifications uh, in a timely manner. And you know, I want to thank Sophia. Even if she wasn't manager of the year, I would be thanking Sophia at this point for leading that effort uh, under RFA. Um, elsewhere in family and children's, are as you know during the pandemic. Our, our hotline calls um, and our associated emergency response as, uh, in, in response to the hotline calls went way down during the pandemic. Uh, kids weren't in school, uh, kids were at home. Uh, the major touch point obviously are teachers and mandated reporters through school, after school programs, and those calls just, just went, went way down. They're now back up to pre-pandemic um, levels, which isn't surprising. And so we are working internally to ensure we have coverage at the hotline and, and emergency response to be able to respond to reports of abuse or neglect that rise to the level that, that warrant a response. And then lastly, uh, just a, a, a CQI highlights, which is a quality, our internal quality improvement um, effort. The case review data for the last fiscal year compared to the state's uh, program improvement goals so statewide and child welfare. There's a, a whole series of, of program improvement goals called PIP goals. Um, we've exceeded the PIP goals in almost all of the outcome performance measures for the last report. And so congratulations really across child welfare because PIP touches everything from initial response to reunification, adoption, foster care placement. Um, and so kudos to the team under Joan and under the family and children's program director leadership. Um, and all the way down to, to the section managers, supervisors, and workers for doing a, a really great job. So I'll conclude with that. And that's actually a great segue into our next agenda item. So if there are any questions, uh, President Conn or commissioners, I'll happy to entertain those now. Any questions from members of the commission for Trent? Yes, I have a question. Go ahead, George. Uh, Trent, uh, the... Uh, New Children's Department, or whatever it's going to be called, um, will that department uh, be part of the Human Services Agency? Uh, Commissioner Yamasaki, no. It's actually, well, interestingly enough, it's modeled after the Human Services Agency, but it is not going to be part of the agency. It's really going to be, it's a separate children's agency with a director and then two departments underneath it, uh, which is the, the existing Department of Children, Youth and Families and the existing Office of Early Care and Education. And so similar to us, where we form the Human Services Agency with 
the Department of Human Services and the, which is now the Department of Benefits and Family Support and the Department of Aging and Adult Services, which is now Disability and Aging Services, those two departments under an agency structure, very similar structure, but entirely separate from us and entirely separate commission from us. It's really, it's really commissioner the, the contracted services. So Department of Children, Youth and Families has given these 200 contracts to provide everything, everything from tutoring programs, after school support, rec programs, um, family support, uh, all in partnership with community-based organizations. Similarly, the Office of Early Care and Education has contracts. First Five uh, Commission has contracts. It's really about more about kind of alignment across contracted services than it is about city government providing direct services like we do, like our protective service workers or our employment specialists or eligibility workers. So that helps kind of with the distinction. Thank you. Any other questions of uh, Mr. Roar? Seeing uh, the, James uh, McRae, uh, Mr. Chairman, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Oh, Mr. Rohr, first of all, I, I know we're moving quickly and I, I want to celebrate with Ms. Isom, but that was power packed. We're talking about money. We're talking about shifts in emphasis. We're talking about new, uh, new um, uh, focus coming from the mayor. You know, I'm, I'm excited about our January meeting and hearing where we're going to be going in next, next year. But season's greetings, everyone, and thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. It is exciting. It's you know, it's 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 seeing a surplus locally, statewide. <laughs> it's, and then, Commissioner, if the federal Build Back Better Act passes, that's a, a whole another set of priorities and funding for mm -hmm. for our work, from mm -hmm. children's support mm -hmm. to uh, fam getting families back into the workforce to mm -hmm. adult services. So, you know, it's hopefully it's you know a lot of uh, of holiday presents for us in January. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. All right Thanks, right on, man. Yeah. Well, if there are no other questions, we're going to move forward to item five, which is normally we have a uh, manager of the month, but being December, uh, we have the manager of the year. And I must tell you that this year, um, the recipient is Sophia Isom, which is we're all very excited for. Uh, I had an opportunity to talk with her last week and congratulate her earlier in the week. And I will say that <laughs> I asked her, do you have any relatives that might be attending the meeting? And if so, could you give me their names? Well, there are too many for me to read, actually. She sent me a text that was like the Gettysburg Address. There are so many people online to celebrate her uh, family and friends that I can't even begin to tell you. But I'm going to go forward and read what we have prepared here. So we are pleased to announce that Sophia Isom, a program director with the Family and Children's Services is the manager of the year. Ms. Isom has a long storied career in public child welfare, working in every FCS program and overseeing or leading the major child welfare initiatives to redesign the child welfare system over the past 30 years. Sophia began her journey with the Family and Children's Services as an intern in 1989 through the Master of Social Work program at San Francisco State University. In 1991, she was hired as the protective services worker and worked in the family maintenance and court dependency units. Upon her promotion to a protective service supervisor in 1995, she was assigned to the emergency response unit and then transferred to the foster care licensing unit in 1997. She became a program manager for the long-term foster care program currently known as the Supportive Transition Unit in 1998. Three years later, Sophia became a program director she currently leads the permanency team and oversees the supportive transition units, adoptions program, child and teaming facilitators, resource family approval program, and family and children's service nurses. Starting in 2018, after being an early implementer in resources family approval, also known as RFA, 
and facing a number of challenges, Sophia marshaled her team with her leadership skills and addressed the challenges associated with running the RFA program. The team reduced the number of pending homes significantly and just completed a biannual RFA review where they are averaging 91 days to approval with placements in the home. The state average is 120 days. Always with a positive and energetic demeanor, Sophia navigates the numerous program director responsibilities with grace and expertise. Her leadership capabilities have proven to be especially remarkable during the ongoing pandemic. In spite of the challenges associated with the early days of COVID, Ms. Isom conducted ongoing assessment, addressed the training needs of staff, clients, and caregivers, held numerous case consults, and solicited support from the community partners and providers. She ensured personal protective equipment was easily accessible for staff, clients, and caregivers, and implemented temporary changes in state regulations in a timely manner. As a result of Ms. Isom's guidance, the RFA program was able to provide caregivers with food boxes, clothing, laptops, iPads, and other items support virtual training visits and other resources family needs. Sophia made herself available to speak with numerous caregivers to address their concerns during the height of the pandemic. Currently, Ms. Isom is working closely with the nursing program to get clients and caregivers vaccinated. All of this in addition to Sophia's non-pandemic related regular duties that help to ensure permanency, well-being, self-sufficiency, and support for clients. Some of these duties include recruiting resource families and finding homes for foster kids and housing for non-minor dependents. To find potential resource parents who reside in San Francisco, Ms. Isom and her team has engaged in recruiting efforts. She works closely with the Human Service Agency communications team, the primary caregiver liaison recruiter, and Family and Children's Services Program Analysts on Media Campaigns for Resource Families. Ms. Isom does not merely oversee programs for resource families. She is an advocate and advocate on a mission to obtain permanency for foster youth and non-minor dependents. She co coordinates quarterly and monthly meetings to provide an opportunity for resource parents to address their concerns and propose solutions. As a result of her commitment to caregivers, Sophia is the lead contact for HSA's participation in Quality Parenting Initiative, initiative a nationally recognized program. She works closely with program manager Robin Love, which should be a pleasure, I'm sure, and her team to help obtain housing and other services for minor dependents. She coordinated a resource fair sponsored by HSA for non-minor dependents and older foster youth. Ms. Isom strongly believes that every foster youth deserves an opportunity to reunify with their parents. Whenever this is not possible, it is a high priority to find an adoptive home or legal guardianship for each family and children's service client. Over the last four years, staff in the adoptions unit finalized approximately 304 adoptions. Ms. Isom is, is an adopted parent, which gives her a firsthand perspective of the importance of permanency for foster youth. In addition to her role as program director, Ms. Isom is a student of the Barrier Social Service Consortium Leadership Training Program and serves on the local homeless coordinating board. She also participates in numerous work groups and committees. She was involved with the Green Book Initiative and the Reunification Project with the Annie E. Casey Foundation. Ms. Isom developed the African-American specialist role in FCS and joined the FCS Disappropriately Work Group. She is co-chair of the coordinating committee for the annual Black History Celebration in FCS. 
Ms. Eisen is once again walking through the floor to say good morning or good afternoon to everyone there, which was definitely missed during the pandemic. Congratulations, Ms. Eisen, and thank you for your commitment and service to the clients of the Family Children's Services, and please keep up the great work. Executive Rohr, do you have any comments? Oh, yes. <laughs> I have had the pleasure of working with and alongside Ms. Isom for two decades. And one, she actually um, stepped up and was acting deputy director over family and children's in early 2000s when we were going through a transition. And I, mean, I could talk for a long time. I just want to say a few adjectives that come to mind when I think of Sophia and her, and her work. I mean, uh, professional caring, conscientious, positive. She's always smiling. She's smiling now, but she's always smiling. <laughs> Team builder, uh, which I think you can tell by all, uh, so many people here on, on, online on the Zoom. So happy that everyone got to join us. I, I, I think it strikes me the most, Sophia, about you and for everyone is, is you, all, you do, I mean, Commissioner uh -huh. Khan, President Khan, you were reading for about 10 minutes how much work you're involved with and how much you do and, and the professionalism with which you approach the way you do with your work. But I, what strikes me is, and I can tell by the way you talk about your work and when, when we're together talking about whether it's a particular family or an issue or something, is that you really care about what you do. And I think that really drives uh, your work and why you do your work so well is because you care so much about the kids we serve, the families we serve, the resource parents that are our partners in helping kids and it shows and you know maybe that's why you smile so much because your work is rewarding to you as difficult as child welfare is uh, and as much as it changes and all the regulations and everything that you need to lead you know that stuff falls to our program directors and to you to implement usually without much guidance or at least clear guidance from the state and so um i just appreciate the way that you approach your work Always appreciate your smile and your good sense of humor. Appreciate you see, seeing you at the outside events, the holiday party every year. Um, just so pleased that, that the commission and uh, the executive leadership team here at HSA can honor you in this way. And congratulations on such a well-deserved Manager of the Year Award for 2021. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, <laughs> well, congratulations. I, thank you, everyone. I have to say, I am so humbled and appreciative of this uh, recognition. Uh, thank you so much, President Khan, Commissioners, Executive Director Trent Rohr. Um, I, I'm just, I, I feel like I'm in a dream. I love my job, I love my staff. I want to just take a few minutes to Zoom. thank um, all my siblings, nieces, nephews, cousins, aunts, and uncles, and friends uh, who made the effort to attend this meeting to be with me through this special moment. I especially want to thank my husband, Greg, my son, Donald, and my mother, Pauline Trotman, because they have shared me <laughs> with this job for the past three decades, and I love them so much for that. They know how much I love the work I do, how important uh, family and uh, children are for me, and uh, you know, it's not a typical nine to five job. They, they see me at it and, the, and they have supported me. And so I just really wanted to acknowledge my family. Um, I definitely have to acknowledge all my staff. Um, you know, without them and the dedication and professionalism that they do with their task and commitment to families, I would not be receiving this recognition. And I sincerely appreciate each and every one of you, Alice, Angela, Arlene, Jose, Alan, Sean, Kelly, Dina, Veronica, Tiffany, Kimberly, and although Eileen has retired and Numa has went on, uh, I've, I feel like I've had one of the best leadership teams that supported me through all my goals. 
you know, some things have not been easy, but we've always found a way to work through it. Uh, the other thing that I appreciate about being here 30 years is just the relationships that I've been able to form with people. Uh, Tracy, Sharon Bell, you know, the, my colleagues on the management team, um, love you guys very much. And there again, you guys are always supporting me. Um, and I have to just say it has been a nice experience. I've received so many calls and emails and people stopping me in the hallway, uh, really thanking me for the work that I've done and uh, telling me I truly deserve this recognition. Um, I'm so pleased. I feel so well respected and honored. And I just have to share with you that I guess somehow or another, the announcement got out to the community and I received a wonderful email from a former foster youth that I have never met in my life. Um, but she wanted to take the time to let me know that the work that we do matters. She was impressed by whatever she <laughs> saw in the write-up of me. And she really wanted me to know that the foster care system had served her well. Um, and I, that just meant a lot to me uh, to get that type of recognition from a former foster youth that I had never met in my life. And it just motivates me to keep on doing what I'm doing. Um, there again, can't do it without my wonderful staff and family. Uh, Trent, uh, your words meant so much to me. And yeah, we go back. I've been working with you since you set foot in, <laughs> set foot in the door. Uh, you've been amazing. And I also have to take a minute to thank my deputy director, Joan Miller. Joan, thank you so much for Seeing my uh, potential accomplishments and believing in believing in me, it means so much. Um, this has been a wonderful journey for me. Uh, I'm just, like I said, humble and very appreciative. Thanks for all the beautiful comments in the chat. Uh, my team got flowers for me and uh, goodies and a gift. And this has just been an amazing time. So thank you so much to everyone. Thank you. Congratulations, Congratulations Sissy. We love you. Congratulations. We love you. Congratulations. Thank you. Congrats, Sophia. Congrats. Thank you. Okay, bye. Love you, Soph. Love you. Thank you. Love you. <laughs> Congratulations, <laughs> sister in law. I will work. I will work. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank Mr. You. President. Okay. Mr. President. <laughs> may, may, I, may I just, may I just add? Thank you very much. May I just add that um, it's been my pleasure to to work. Uh, more or less on an informal basis with Sophia for many years. And uh, for me, this caps her, this caps her many accomplishments uh, for the department and the agency uh, and the uh, recognition as manager of the year is most appropriate but may I add that um, Sophia has the smile of a lifetime. <laughs> Thank you for everything, Thank you. Sophia. Thank you, Commissioner Yamasaki. Thank you so much. Okay, we're going to move forward to... No. Okay. Does anybody else want to say anything? Well, I just to want to say thank you so much for your service, Ms. Isom. Thank you for your welcoming me when I've stepped foot in the door. And I wish you continued, continued health and wellness. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mommy, do you want to say anything to Sophie? Hey, Biz. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, my God. Mommy, I did take her off mute so she can say something. I am very proud of my baby girl. <laughs> Thank you, mommy. Thank you, everybody. And, and, yes, 
Yes, I'm proud of my children. You really, you stand out there, girl. <laughs> Thank you, mommy. Thanks, and, everybody. And your Thank aunt you. and godmother is very proud of you. Too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so and your everybody. We, we, we can't take over the commission meeting, okay? Yes, so, we can. Yes, we can. <laughs> <Be sure. laughs> Thank you so we much. I just wanted mommy to say something. Thank, Thank you, Desi. <laughs> okay, bye. <laughs> what do you mean you can't take over? You have taken over. <laughs> there you go. Can I say Well, we must, we must return <laughs> and, to and, uh, business at hand, okay? And your Aunt Frances. Congratulations, Sophie. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> oh, this is yeah. great. Okay, Later. so now we're going to move on to item six, uh, our consent calendar. Do any of my fellow commissioners want to remove an item for individual discussion? If not, then can I ask for a motion to approve? So moved. There's a second, second in favor. Aye. Aye. So moved. Item seven, um, we have our Deputy District Attorney David Reese with us discussing um, combining approvals of several contracts which has come up before for the commission. David, are you here? I am on morning. So, yes, yeah, so I wanted to attend because I know this has come up in, uh, in past meetings. Um, just the procedural issue of when the commission is approving grants and contracts, uh, the notion of you know, consolidating the resolutions to approve those uh, so that, you know, really just for the, um, to keep your meetings going. There have been times I know when there's dozens of grants or contracts up for uh, approval at the commission and, um, so, you know, wanted to uh, advise on the, I think a preferable and more practical um, procedure of, of grouping those. So especially when you've got one RFP for multiple grants or contracts um, that the uh, commission can proceed with those, you know, in groups. So it's not different than the consent calendar uh, you know, item that, uh, that you just had. Um, so the busy, you know, as, as long as all those proposed grants or contracts are listed out in the agenda that is, um, uh, you know, publicly posted in advance of the meeting, that provides the public access that state law and our local law, you know, guarantees that the public has an opportunity to both see what business the commission will be conducting, knows with enough specificity, what are the items that are on the agenda for this body, uh, and therefore has, of course, the right to attend these meetings, to comment you know, publicly. Um, and uh, from there, um, I would advise Commissioner Khan uh, that there is, it's even in Robert's rules of order, uh, as you conduct these meetings, uh, you know, by unanimous consent, um, as it says on the agenda for the for the consent agenda that you can then group these items together and that unanimous consent means that at any time any one commissioner can ask to have a single item you know pulled off of that grouping or consolidation and to be considered and discussed and heard by the commission separately um, but otherwise by unanimous consent you know you can maintain these separate resolutions or, 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 you know, most cases, I think we are considering this for, for contract or grant approvals. You can keep those together and, uh, and vote on them by a single motion. And so in the spirit of open and public, uh, you know, access and discussion, you know, want to come in and invite an invitation the commission wants to have on that procedure. Commissioner Yamasaki. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. City Attorney uh, David, I uh, 
I must respectfully um, disagree with some of the uh, remarks that that you made. Um, historically, this commission has, especially with regard to new grants and contracts, uh, individually discussed and voted on uh, these items individually. Um, I can understand the efficacy of grouping uh, relatively minor, non, um, well, just about everything we do affects people. But there, there are things like um, uh, services, office services and things like that, that possibly uh, could fall into the routine uh, category. But the, uh, and, and I cite uh, as an example, uh, the recent experience of uh, Commissioner McRave, uh, if I may uh, use your uh, uh, request that was not honored uh, about the 94124 zip code uh, coverage in one of the grouped contrasts. And that question was never addressed. Uh, I just cite that as an example. Uh, if, if we, especially, with regard to new grants and contracts, I don't believe this is an appropriate uh, method. It's, I, I believe it's, it's uh, efficient to group contracts to uh, even new ones to um, uh, explain the uh, um, sources of uh, uh, revenue and, and things of that nature. But as far as the actual provision of services, I believe that each contract deserves a, a separate, and, and there may be no questions, but at least the opportunity to uh, get specifics about that particular contractor grant. And I think that's very important for the kind of work we do. Uh, and uh, as I say, historically, we have always discussed items of this nature separately and sometimes with very little discussion, and sometimes with quite a bit of discussion. But um, your advice, of, uh, I, for which I thank you, indicated that by adopting the agenda unanimously, which we invariably do, we are automatically approving this procedure for the uh, grouped items. Uh, I don't question that that may be uh, acceptable under Robert's rules, but I don't think that's good practice. And um, we have commission rules, which I'm sure not many people are even aware of, and fewer people have read, but uh, I, I would even propose at least the uh, consideration or investigation of a commission rule uh, requiring um, after con uh, without con unanimous consent, uh, the uh, discussion and voting individually 
on uh, new items, uh, new services, uh, and we could place that in the commission rules and accept it from the uh, apparent uh, Roberts rules procedure of treating the adoption of the agenda by unanimous vote as the unanimous consent for grouping and voting on uh, multiple items. And uh, Commissioner McCrary, you may wish to comment on this because uh, I believe you had a, a significant question that was not addressed. And, and this is just an example. Uh, we're, in a, we're not in a commercial business where we're trying to get uh, widgets produced as rapidly as possible. We're working with people and uh, we need to be able to ask questions and, and uh, get information about how the uh, uh, programs are going to be uh, administered. And also, uh, and I, re I realize that COVID makes it difficult, if not impossible, to do this, but uh, it was practice to have directors or other representatives of uh, agencies that are receiving new contracts or grants to, to come before us and, and give us an idea of what specifically they have in mind for their potential uh, clients and gave us the opportunity to ask questions like the 94124 zip code question uh, about uh, elements of the, uh, of the uh, proposed agreement. And I, for, I apologize to all for ranting and raving and uh, perhaps being stuck in the past, but I, I think we had uh, a good procedure going and it, it was, uh, in my opinion, uh, violated by the action that we took recently in um, approving multiple uh, new uh, programs without discussion, without individual discussion. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes, and so it was my intent to essentially, you know, advise what could be done, um, and again, to assure that you know, there wasn't a violation of state law or you know local law. But in terms of you know practice or the how this body wants to you know conduct itself. Um, that's why I do emphasize it's by unanimous consent and that you know you as a, or any individual commissioner um, can always you know insist uh, that any particular item you know get its full discussion and so um, and so you know that I think is available well you all kind of you know share and, and comment on the agenda before the meeting but otherwise you know it's you know tip of the first item is to adopt the agenda that's an opportunity to um, call out any specific item for, uh, for for discussion and then you know upon any actual vote um, again there's an opportunity if uh, discussion or focus on a on a single item um, you know, is desired by, again, any, any individual commissioner. Um, so, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, through, through the chair, uh, thank you, Commissioner Yamasaki. Uh, I simply want to say at, at this time, I understand legally we are functioning within uh, the capability of, of our legal team, the city, the state to approve what we do. Also, there is now a way of how, how do we, as the, the commission, want to structure our agenda so as to 
so as to, to meet the needs of the members within, within the commission. So I, I would simply suggest that uh, uh, President Khan and Commissioner Yamasaki and our secretary have a cup of coffee and talk about how they, they want to do the agenda going forward. And we shape it in that way. Uh, I'm certainly okay with, uh, with discussing it with Commissioner Yamasaki, Yamasaki and Elizabeth. Uh, maybe we can make a telephone conversation and uh, since we can't, it's too hard to meet in person. Right. But we can do that. What do you say, George? Well, uh, that's that's fine as 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 long as you're the president and I'm a, a commissioner. Uh, however, I think it should our longstanding practice is is, a, is one that we should assure continuance of. And uh, I, I appreciate that today there's a, a great move for um, expedient action and uh, uh, people have, have no qualms about approving in the private sector as well as in the public sector, millions of dollars uh, just basically uh, uh, on the basis of, 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 I won't say scanty information, but uh, limited information. And our, our old practice of having um, new, especially new agreements uh, uh, discussed individually, and if possible, having representatives of the agency uh, appear to give their uh, perspective and their their plans and to be able to answer questions. And um, uh, if perhaps just uh, a policy statement that we would uh, somehow memorialize and with with the uh, expectation that uh, future commissions uh, might find this advice helpful. Certainly, consider me available if you want to, you know, visit the bylaws of the commission, or um, you know, or certainly attend any of these commission meetings going forward. Okay. All right. Well, I, 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 just, I, I, oh, sorry. I, just, I, I think our chair has, has gotten, gotten this understood and I, I, I trust that he and uh, our secretary, Mr. Rohr and you and all of us will work it as we go forward. I appreciate having the opportunity to have as much information available, whether we call upon it or not as possible, particularly around new ventures, new, new actions. So I concur wholeheartedly. But I think that's that's us structuring ourselves to permit that to happen within our time. Yeah. Yeah. And Commissioner McCray, I would support that as well. I think it's important that we hear each individual. Item. So, mm -hmm. and I know you know, according to the city attorney Reese, we have the option to do both. So, well, Elizabeth can work with David, and uh, you know, I certainly, I, George, I respect what you're saying, and maybe on a case by case basis, we should just continue the way we were and not try to uh, facilitate running a faster meeting. That wasn't the purpose to do that. And so I think the more discussion that we have, the better off we would be. So I'm, I'm fine with it either way, actually. Uh, Elizabeth? Um, 
Do uh, do we do we need to to uh, uh, Mr. Chair? Do we need to uh, put this in the parking lot in some formal way to make sure we get it back and we and we get or just see how it flows over the, the upcoming meetings in the new year? Well, I think we should personally. I think we should see how it flows. Okay. I mean, I'm All not right. going to take a suggestion by Commissioner Yamasaki to heart. We certainly should. So, uh, it. Um, I don't want to necessarily just rush through a meeting. That's for sure. So, any information that can be helpful in our decision making process uh, is important to me that we continue that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Okay. And to confirm, yeah, this was just an item for discussion. There's yeah. no action to be yeah. taken. Yeah. You know, right. And it's and it's again purely a you know matter of how the body conducts itself and uh, in its meetings. Okay. Glad to advise going forward. Well, moving on to item. Thank you, Mr. Attorney. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Pleasure. Thank you, David. Uh, Thank you, David. Uh, moving on to item eight, commission business action items. Item A, to consider whether to continue use of teleconferencing will minimize health risks and whether our commission is able to use teleconferencing in a manner that allows public participation and transparency. We are requesting approval of the resolution making findings to allow teleconference meetings under California government code section 54953E. This is per the new state law that the commission must make these findings once every 30 days, as long as they continue to meet remotely. Can I ask for a motion? So move. There a second? second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. Item B, uh, Christina Iwasaki, requesting authorization to modify the existing grant agreement with Catholic Charities to provide housing locator, connector and stabilization services for the period January 1st, 2022 to June 30th. Hi, good morning. 2022 for an additional amount of $957,751 plus a 10% contingency for a revised total amount not to exceed three million sixty-nine thousand and twenty-two dollars. Hi, good morning, Commissioner Khan and uh, President Khan and Commissioners. My name is Christina Iwasaki. I'm the Community Services Manager for Welfare to Work Services. The Department of Benefits and Family Support requests authorization to modify the existing grant with Catholic Charities for the purpose of housing locator, housing connector, and housing stabilization services in order to obtain and retain permanent housing. This grant modification will provide additional CalWORKs families with these services. So this fiscal year, the state provided additional funding for the CalWORKs Housing Support Program, HSP, which was established by Senate Bill 855 in order to foster housing stability for CalWORKs families experiencing homelessness. HSP offers financial assistance and housing related wraparound supportive services, including but not limited to rental assistance, housing navigation, case management, security deposits, and move-in costs. Catholic Charities will provide CalWORKs families living in shelters, transitional housing programs, and families who are at risk of losing their permanent housing with this housing locator, housing connector, and housing stabilization services. In addition, Catholic Charities provides employment services, which offers a robust set of individualized support, including linkages to our Jobs Now program. Catholic Charities will provide housing placement services for 51 additional families for a total of 90 families placed into housing this year. They also continue to provide housing stabilization support to families already housed. I'm available to answer any questions and we have representatives from Catholic Charities as well. Uh, James McCray through the chair question. Thank you so very much. I mean, this, well, I, I just want how broadly can can we work with our with our clients? 
I think about seven by seven and the expanding of, of, of at least of other areas where I'm working, where we're talking about nine, nine county regions to work together. How much, you, you're, not, you're not, you know what I'm asking. How far can we go? How broadly? Uh, um, as far as we can allow our, you know, our participants want to go. So mm -hmm. I, I will let um, Jose Cartagena or someone else from Catholic Charities talk about no. that a little bit more. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, uh, for the opportunity to partner with the department to house mm -hmm. families mm -hmm. in different areas in the, in the state. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, housing in San Francisco is, is almost impossible for some yeah, of our families yeah. because of the cost. Yeah. And yeah. we are able to house families in 110 miles radius from San Francisco. Okay. That also okay. means that we are moving as far as Modesto, as far if you go to the North Lake County, mm -hmm. uh, Sacramento area, mm -hmm. 110 miles is mm -hmm. what the, we are housing families. One piece that we are finding right now that uh, housing costs, any mm -hmm. data mm -hmm. pass is increasing uh, mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. is pushing us further. The reason mm -hmm. uh, we are moving further is because the housing costs. Maybe two years mm -hmm. ago, we were finding housing uh, Vallejo, Richmond, mm -hmm. closer mm -hmm. to the mm -hmm. Bay Area, but any day that pass, housing costs increase on in those areas. And mm -hmm. that's what is pushing us further. Okay. Hopefully okay. we will keep it in the 110 miles radius, but the housing cost will increase. It's only, and that's where we are placing families. Uh, just based on our past, is that is the 110 mile radius state federal mandated, or is that as far as you think you could hold it together with, with, with the program and the person's participation? The requirement that mm -hmm. we have in our program that we have to do home visit, site visit, mm -hmm. we have to accompany yeah, yeah. families, and yeah. then yeah. putting a food there is going to be a, more costly because yeah. one house visit to these areas is one day of work for the case manager. Yes, but yes. That, 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 yeah, mm -hmm. that's, that's the limitation, but uh, probably in the future is going to be needed if the housing cost increases, either increase the subsidy amount or increase the distance from where we are going to be placing families. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You, thank you are you very welcome. Thank and you. thank you for the opportunity, uh, Catholic Charities. Uh, in the peak of the pandemic, we were able to house uh, a lot of families. And also, the pandemic teaches a lot of new ways to provide services. Now we are using Zoom, we are using Team, we are using uh, to do case management face to face through Team. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a staff uh, showing unit through FaceTime. Mm -hmm. The family is in the shelter, the worker is in the unit showing the unit through FaceTime, mm -hmm. through the phone. And the pandemic has shown us a new way to do business, to do it better. And we mm -hmm. will continue using that. And thank you for the opportunity uh, right that the yeah. department gave us to house families. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So can I have a motion to approve the three million sixty nine thousand twenty two dollars? So move. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. Thank you. Thank you. Item C, requesting authorization to enter into a new contract agreement with ICF for FFPSA prevention consultation and planning support for a period of January 1st, 2022 through December 31st, 2023 in the amount of $1,017,490. Uh, calling on Melissa Connolly. Good morning, Melissa. Good morning, President Kahn and commissioners. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, yeah great. Um, I'm Melissa Connolly. I'm an acting program director with Family and Children's Services, and I'm here to request authorization to enter into this contract with ICF Incorporated for two years, starting January 1st, 2022. Um, for an amount not to exceed $1,017,490. Um, this contract will facilitate the development of a citywide five-year child abuse prevention plan 
which we're very excited about. Um, as outlined in the Family First Prevention Services Act of 2018, also known as FFPSA. Um, it includes some um, uh, extremely important deliverables, including a state mandated FFPSA plan that is due by uh, September 30th, 2022. Mm. Um, an asset map and readiness assessment of our community and a development of technical assistance, training and support to mm. implement evidence-based prevention services for the children and families in San Francisco to prevent their involvement with our child welfare system. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm available to answer any questions and um, look forward to hearing what you have to So she had more at peace. That's yeah. what it is. Because as you get older, you don't have to remember too much. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, through, through the chair, Mr. Khan. Yes. Um, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, does ICF come fully contained with with its staffing to do these various uh, components and milestones, or does it have to bring on new people? And if so, are there ways for our clients to participate in, in the work going on as as they as we ramp up and, and develop skills? So it's my understanding that they have the staff already on board that they will use to do the engagement work, but a big part of their work with us is engaging with community members, mm -hmm. community-based <laughs> providers already here in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. They're not about, um, you know, imposing a model on us. They're um, about engaging with the community providers that already exist here in San Francisco mm -hmm. and building capacity to meet the requirements mm -hmm. of the FFPSA and helping them be able to maximize claiming of federal funds going forward under ah. FFPSA for the prevention services that they'll provide. Okay, so any ramping up will go on within our, within our ages with our, okay, all right, very good. Yep. Yeah. I, I'm just thinking about the face that's coming to me to, yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah, and, and Commissioner, just to, so you know, it's the, the value of FFPSA or Family First Prevention Services Act is to have families served in the community. So a big mm. part of that work is engaging with the community into that. And I don't know if Melissa mentioned this already. Mm. We are engaging with Safe and Sound because they're part of the FRC Alliance. So we're engaging, they're at the table in all the planning to bring mm -hmm. us the community also. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, good. If there are no other questions, can I have a motion to uh, approve item C for $1,017,490? So move. There a second? A second? Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. So moved. Thank you very much. Item Thank D. Thank you. Calling on. Thank you. Yaakov, Thank you. Jakob Kiflum, requesting approval of a sole source waiver and authorization in to enter into a new sole source contract with ACF Technologies Incorporated for the provision of software and maintenance services for the lobby management system for the period of January 1st, 2022 through June 30th, 2024, and the amount of $292,390 plus a 10% contingency for a total amount not to exceed $321,629. Yes, uh, yes, th thank you. My name is uh, Jacob Kuflon. I work within the program support operations within HSA. And like you said, we would like to have a sole source waiver and authorization to enter into a new sole source contract with ACF Technologies for the period of January 1st, 2022 through January 30th, 2024, and an amount of 292,000, plus 10% contingency for total not to exceed 321,629. So I'll give you a uh, background uh, of what ACF does and what the uh, key flow is. 
2013, with the passage of the ACA bill, we had a huge influx of clients using our services and we wanted to have a better mechanism of tracking our lobby uh, as well as our phone. So Qflow and ACF were very instrumental in making sure that we were able to gauge the number of people that came into our office as well as schedule appointments for future uh, over the phone or in person. And when people come to our office, we have kiosks and they can select what language they wanna get from the kiosk. And within the kiosks, we have our threshold languages. So a person can come in, click on Russian, get what information they want, it'll print it out. And then when they're called to service, the announcement is gonna be made in Russian downstairs in the lobby. So we make sure that the threshold languages are incorporated within our kiosks as well as our audio system. So Keyflow has been very, very important during the pandemic where we had to shift away from face-to-face -to, -face to phones. And we built a lot of our appointments over the phones and then our staff who are telecommuting can call individuals uh, over the phone. So that's my synopsis. And so we would, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer your questions in regards to Keyflow and how we use it within uh, our city. Are there any questions from members of the commission? Yes, sir, through the chair. Thank you. Well, that's uh, my, my first question is this only for the lobby at the, our main office? Oh, no, no, sir. So oh, it's sorry. gonna be at our lobby at 1440 Harrison, 1235 Mission, uh, 170 uh, Otis, uh, uh, to golf. And we do use it at 3120, but at 3120, we don't have the kiosk. But we do have uh, the, the structure of Qflow where individuals can have appointments made for them at 3120. But at the other four locations, we have the kiosk as well as the audio announcement. So if you come in, sir, and you want to get services and you speak a different language, we make mm -hmm. sure that that language threshold is there. You mm -hmm. select it. And then when the announcement is made, the announcement is made in your native uh, tongue. Beautiful. So then you know where it's coming from okay. for. So for me, if I came in, I speak Tigray, and if the announcement was made in Tigray, then I can hear my native tongue over the announcements. Yes, okay. Um, through the chair, one final question. When, when, whenever I hear you say several times, sole source, wh wh what are you saying to me in the public? What, what, are, what are we, why are we sole sourcing this matter? Good question. I don't want to give you any misinformation. So I'm going to rely on the contract person mm -hmm. to talk about that because I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not really sure what that means, sir. So mm -hmm. I don't want to give you false uh, narratives. Okay, good. All right. Thank hi. you. Thank you. Hi. hi. Good morning. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning, President Khan. My name is Leslie Lau. I'm a contracts manager here, here at HSA. Um, um, for your uh, particular question regarding sole source. Um, so this, this original contract was originally... Um, um, done through a regular uh, RFP, then mm -hmm. back in 2012. Okay. Um, okay. We are seeking a sole source because um, uh, through the through all throughout the years, the ACF developed customizations that were specifically for our agency. So okay. they're the only okay. ones that could you know they're they're proprietary holders or rights of the software. So that's why this is more of a sole source. Gotcha. I appreciate the, the, the background knowledge that how we got to where we are. That's important yeah. to know the relationship. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Can I have a motion to approve item D for $321,629? Move approval. There are second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. Aye. Uh, moving on to our last item, public comment. Is there any public comment? Seeing none, then our meeting is adjourned. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Happy holidays, season greetings, and uh, see you in the new year. Thank you. Happy holidays, everyone. All right. Thank you.